Hello, everyone. Hmm? Um, I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be today among you and to spend the day with you from a very simple reason, you know. There are a lot of wise people every square meter here and somehow I have the internal expectation that at the end of all these sessions I'll become a bit wiser as well. So, just a second. Poți să-mi tragi puțin de o secundă. You know, when I was uh, totally, totally un uh, unexpectedly invited to have this TED talk today, and this was just like 24 hours ago, something like that. Uh, I couldn't, I couldn't help but thinking that one thing. I had my first TED talk back in 2009 when I was just fresh, but being just fresh means being one day fresh from an expedition very ironical, you know, ironically to the same mountain that I now returned from, the Shisha Pangma, when I had to turn back from 7,500 meter, meters because on, of an incipient pulmonary edema. So at that time, I was, um, let's say, explaining in a TED talk, let's say, my failure at climbing Shisha Pangma and it seems so that now, after some years, in 2013, I will uh, explain my survival after my, this time, successful climbing the Shisha Pangma, the same mountain that I was speaking at my first TED talk. Uh, and one short uh, bracket. Last time I was here, I think, I don't know, 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago, when I was a student in physics in my first year. Uh, in high school, I was highly passionate by physics. I arrived here, and uh, I have to admit now with, uh, let's say, with a kind of regret, that at those time, after one year here, I thought that my only chance at being su successful with physics, of course I was totally wrong, was emigrating and doing, going to do some research outside. Or to be a teacher, like my father, he's a geography teacher, and uh, not doing it so well, let's say. So after one year of physics, I took the decision that I want to stay in Romania. I don't want to leave the country. And in my mind, back then, this meant that I had to change my faculty. So I went to International Business Administration in ASE. Quite a change, right? And uh, so am I. Now, doing international stuff, but not business administration. But it, it's somehow related with all my path till now. I think cutting edge science has always meant crossing the line. I think cutting edge physics has always meant crossing the line. High-end climbing has always meant 
crossing the line. And successful line crossing, it's an art form. Be this in science or be this in sport. I think this is the art of the dreamer, be it in science or in sport, who is also a doer, expressing himself and his own humanity in a new discovery, or why not in a challenging route up on an 8,000 meter peak. The commitment to this art, the art of crossing the line, of what is possible or what it is commonly accepted as, uh, I don't know, maybe ordinary knowledge, it's not the best word, can take you to one of the most intimate journeys that as you as a human being can undertake. I believe that having the chance for even for, for, for a short glimpse over the edge, okay, even, even for a passing second, it is the privilege, it is the huge, it is a huge privilege of a, of a very few. But getting beyond of what is known or what is commonly ac accepted as being possible, most often means also stretching yourself to the maximum, psychologically and physically. And even more, all this cannot be achieved without really taking significant risks. In a way, this art, it's the art of managing risks. But you will wonder, why bother of getting yourself cornered in such an extreme way? As the French writer René Domol put it, what is above knows what is below. But what is below does not know what is above. One climbs, one sees. One descends, one sees no longer, but one has seen. There is an art of conducting yourselves in the lower region by the memory of what one so higher up. When one can no longer see, one at least still know. Or as I used to say, and I like to say, for me, climbing mountains outside is climbing mountains inside. Congratulations for being unsuccessful in getting yourself killed. This is what my partner and friend Tunj Findik from Turkey told me the moment I arrived in I arrive alive in base camp after my ascent of Shisha Pangma. You know, this remained onto my into my brain from, from then. Uh, you know, I think I'm a very, very unreasonable man. I'm very unreasonable, unreasonable when it comes, sorry for my small uh, uh, potting nail, but I'm still fresh from my ascent, so blind spot still on my brain. Uh, so I'm unreasonable, unreasonable when, it come down, when it comes down to my dreams, when it comes down to the projects I get involved into, with, 
And when it comes down to the expectations I set about myself, there are 14 summits in the world crossing the matching line of 8,000 meter elevation. All of these are in the Central Asia, in the border regions of Nepal, Tibet, China, India, and Pakistan. And as a comparison, these summits are for climbers what, let's say, a Grand Slam tournament it is for a, for a tennis player. Imagine that the oxygen concentration in, in the air at 8,000 meter, it's only one third from the one we, we encounter in this conference room in Mogurele. I like to say Mogurele because I haven't been here <laughs> for a long time. The most dangerous of all of them is considered the one Nepali peak called Annapurna, who has a fatality rate of 41%. This is nowadays, before the 90s, this was, oops, uh, before the 90s, this was 66%, so quite, quite huge. Most of these ascents are still done using uh, su supplementary oxygen and Sherpa support. And when, when I'm saying most of this, I'm saying more than 99, 95%. So it's quite a, uh, let's say, a small group of people doing this without. Imagine that since 1950, when the first 8,000 meter summit has been climbed, and uh, as an irony, this has been the same Annapurna that is the most dangerous, but this is another story. And also since the end of the 19th century in 1895, when it was the first try for an 8,000 meter summit, two of them still has no winter ascent. Nobody could get to the top of these summits during the winter time. And even more, five of the other peaks, actually six, has only been climbed in the last maybe four or five years, something like that. More than that, three of these mountains still have no first Romanian ascent. So, <laughs> you got it. I'll pass the down slide, Lux. I think that if you are positive, if you are sure that your goal that will not oppose you any significant um, will not pose you any significant challenge to attain it, more than likely your project or your goal or whatever you are working at, it is really not challenging enough and maybe really not worthing your, your, worthing your time. This is one of the things that really fascinates me most at making a sense at 8,000 meter without using supplementary oxygen and without using Sherpa support. With all the planning in the world, with all the training, with all the sponsors in the world, it is simply not possible for you to know that you will succeed. So many can happen in the thin air of high altitudes. Of course, this doesn't mean that you don't have the fate of 
getting the job done, let's say, in a very pragmatical way. But it just means that the project is so complex and so challenging that the outcome, it, is, it will remain open till the end. It was one line before here, uh, the previous presentation, saying something like that uh, significant research is always improbable or the outcome is improbable or something like that. I think that uh, significant adventures with or without the commas are always, always having an improbable outcome. Okay, climbing a summit over 8,000 meter without using supplementary oxygen, it's madness, okay, from extremely many, many points of view, and there are a lot of arguments against it, okay? One of it, very objective, is the fact that at above 7,000 meters, any acclimatization just becomes impossible. There starts the dead zone, and which each second you spend there, your body starts slowly, slowly to die. That's why an expedition to such a mountain, usually it takes around two months, because most of this time you, you dedicate for your acclimatization, that you only can get till 7,000. So after 7,000, you just have to climb as fast as possible and come down as fast as possible. But I think that one of the things that characterizes me most is, let's say, the, the capacity of thinking at projects which are just on the limit or very, very few, a little bit beyond the limit of what I believe as being possible and to create their uh, space of possibility, let's say, in order for me to manage those risks I was talking about before in a manner and in a way that for me those risks will be acceptable. And very ironically, again, always in the final ascent, yeah, from the last camp, from 7,000 meters and 1,000 something to the summit, always my mind is split in two. 1,000% of it, it is totally focused what, with what is happening outside me, is that cloud there in one hour, let's say, will be a full-blown storm, or if I'm crossing this snow slope, will I start an avalanche, etc., etc. And the other half of me, again, 100%, is totally focused with, of, with what is happening inside myself. Yeah. Do I have symptoms of cerebral edema, pulmonary edema? Uh, is it possible to get myself exhausted and not have enough energy to come down into the base camp, etc., etc. And of course, all this is happening, or I ask my brain to think objectively to an altitude where the plane pilots are flying in pressurized cabins. From a very simple reason why doing this, because I think it does matter how you reach from the point A to the point B, not only reaching to the point B with all the costs, at all costs. So that's why, in my opinion and in my climb, uh, partner's opinion, using supplementary oxygen is a kind of doping, let's say, of cheating. I had a chance, as Mr. Minonov said before, to stay five times over a mountain 
of 8,000 meters. First time was in 2006, I climbed Choyu, second Romanian ascent, 2007, Gasherbrum 1. First Romanian ascent, 2008, Makalu, first Romanian ascent, 2011, Manaslu, second Romanian, and this time, Shisha Pangma, first Romanian ascent. It was the first Romanian try at this summit, and, uh, and today the, 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 the only one successful, one of the other three also being, also being mine. Uh, to cut the story short, I reached the summit ridge. This is one of my partners. You can, say, you can see the exposure. He was climbing with one ice axe on a part of the ridge, the others on the other part of the ridge. And he was like riding the, the summit ridge. We stayed here a lot of time because uh, it was full blown wind. Usually, I mean, the meta was uh, announcing like 30, 40 kilometer per hour in the summit day. We even had 100 kilometers per hour in summit day. I had some stomach disorder. Because of this, I remained in Urma. I'm Ramas in Urma. I was behind my partner, so I summited like one hour and a half after them. And, uh, and uh, yeah, this is the summit photo. And uh, yes, this is the summit video. Jumate noaptea e ora Este ora 3 după amiața Oh, doamne Nu țin Absolut Absolut nimic nu țin Japanma Va fi extrem de Yeah, this was the Simon movie and uh, can I have the slide please? And uh, what what I forgot to tell you was the fact that we left the last camp from 7,100 at one o'clock in the evening. I reached the summit at three o'clock because of this and being left behind. On the way back, the weather changed a bit and I simply couldn't find my way back to the, back to the last camp. No traces, nothing. I started to descend and sometimes with my ice axe uh, with a face on the mountain, sometimes normally, and I realized at the point that the risks of slipping or falling, it's extremely high. So at 7,800, I decided to make a snow hole. There are not so many cases of surviving a bivouac out in the open at 7,800 if you search the internet. Uh, Before releasing my press release a few days ago, 
and I had to do it because I had to do it and showing the summit photos and videos, I simply could not watch these images. I could not. I let this on the last moment, on the totally last moment. I made the first hole after some hours just sitting in the snow because I had no bivouac gear. I was just my, as you saw me on the summit. I realized that soon I will make hypothermia and I will get frostbitten. Anyway, the hole was not full because I was so tired I could not dig it with my ice axe. So I repeat this process three times at that night. That last time I was so wasted, I just made a platform for me to hang in my ice axe like this, you know, in order not to sleep. And I waited for the dawn, praying that it will be good weather for me to see down. I had some moments only in the beginning, in the first two hours, asking myself, okay, that's it? It cannot be just this. No, it, it simply cannot be. I have to find solutions, solutions, solutions. So all, my, all the time my brain was focused on finding solutions. Why? Because I had to take care of the French guy. It was one French guy, imaginary, or it was my guardian angel, I don't know whom it was, but I perceive it as a French guy, and I have to remain safe and alive just because I have to take care of that French guy. So the French guy actually saved me. And this is the first photo I took when the morning came and I was safely at a lower and okay kind of altitude and of slope exposure with a stalactite uh, grown from my headlamp. And I think on a huge mountain, we are merely small dots on the white frozen snow, most of the time at the mercy of the elements, always searching for the good light. And in our strivings, we often have our moments of doubt, our moments of rătăcire, să-i spunem. <laughs> but what keeps us going is the, the fate. We're living on the edge, and this takes us further. In the beginning, and with this I will end my too long TED talk, I said that responsible line crossing is an art form. But I also believe that it is much, much, much more, of, more than that. For some, like the speakers today, who daily strive to go beyond of what is known, and expand the boundary of science, the crossing, crossing the, life, the line is a calling. And I dare to say, it's even a duty to envision larger than life projects for the benefits of all of us. Because what is crossing the line without the betterment of man? Thank you so much.